Um, so thank you everybody for attending today. Um, today we're going to talk about different applications where temperature monitoring can be used to um, work on ESG uh, for mining operations. So getting started here. Um, my bio, um, my name is Haley Croteau. I'm with Beaded Stream and I've been with the company since 2020. Uh, I'm based in the Metro Vancouver area. I'm a, prof a professional engineer with a geotechnical background and I've been working in and around the mining industry for about 20 years now um, between consulting, um, working directly at mine sites or oil sands operations, uh, and then in the last uh, over 10 years now in the geotechnical instrumentation space um, with instrumentation programs for all sorts of different uh, sites. I'm also passionate about looking for new ways of monitoring um, and uh, doing using existing technologies to find different ways of, of monitoring new parameters especially in subsurface where it's hard to see anything without actually having any instrumentation in the ground so today i'll do a brief company introduction um deleted screen for those who aren't familiar with us i'm going to do a, a product overview just to sort of set the stage of the type of equipment that i'm talking about as i move into different applications and then for the applications, it's talking about um, sort of ones within cold regions, and then some applications that can apply to any region. And then we'll finish off with some case histories as well. So Beaded Stream's mission is to enable anyone to collect data easily from anywhere in the world. And we do that by having um, an easy to use system that's plug and play that allows you to collect data from our ground temperature cables, which are shown on the left-hand side here, um, to a small satellite enabled data logger um, into the cloud. And so from that cloud, you can log in and you can view all of your data from your fingertips, wherever you are. Um, we also have an API connection, so you can send data to other platforms as well. And we like to talk about Pearson's law, which is that which is measured improves, but that which is measured and reported improves exponentially. And you know, spending a lot of time collecting data means that sometimes people aren't able to actually use their data. And so by allowing you to have the data collected easily, that gives you more time to be able to use it, to understand what's happening in the ground, um, and to change any processes that you need to change at your site. So about our company, we began in 2004. Our CEO, Brian Shoemaker, is a civil engineer who um, was working in the Alaska market, uh, installing thermistor strings in permafrost and kept getting old analog technology to fix before he had to go put it in the, in the field. And so he started to think maybe there's a better way of doing this and started to develop the concept of our, our digital temperature solutions. Um, we design, manufacture and distribute them based out of Anchorage, Alaska. And um, we've got a team of engineers and, and customer support people that can help um, understand what you're trying to do and um, get new solutions that work for your application. So one concept I'm going to kind of weave through this presentation is um, temperature is an analog. And this is a phrase that somebody gave me on a phone, phone call last summer while I was talking to them about mining applications. And the concept is that you can use temperature as an analog to understand different processes that are happening within the ground. Um, and a lot of these applications that we're gonna talk about later are tied into this concept. It's complementary to other monitoring methods. Um, it may not give you the exact answer of what exactly is happening, but it can give you spatial ideas of temperatures changing in one location, perhaps some processes happening there. Um, and uh, it's kind of an overarching concept. I'm going to return to this uh, version of this slide later on as well. So moving into the product overview. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with analog thermistor cables, um, this is kind of a quick slide to just show, show the differences between the two different types of products. So, Digital versus analog cables. The left-hand side is um, the digital temperature cable that we're using at Beaded Stream. And so with it, we are running um, up to 125 sensors on a single three conductor cable. And what that means is you can have a lot of sensors over a wide spatial area. And when you're talking about applications within mining, um, you're often monitoring large areas and you may need to use a lot of monitoring points. So it's a really helpful technology to use. 
it also is always the same diameter, no matter what, uh, how many sensors you have on that cable. So that allows you to always know exactly what you're gonna get, what you need to install at the site. Versus the right-hand side of this is an analog thermistor cable um, where you have two conductors for each of the sensors on the, on the cable itself. And so you end up reaching sort of a practical limit of 15 or maybe 20 sensors on that cable. Um, and it, it gets to be quite a large size. It gets to be uneconomical. And so, you know, those are great for maybe shorter applications, but not as good for wide area monitoring as well. So a little bit more about our digital temperature cable. Uh, we build them all custom to your specifications um, and your application. We can have up to 125 sensors on them and we can do up to 750 meters length or, or around 2,500 feet. And uh, you know, a lot of applications don't get anywhere near those limits of those lengths, but we have the ability to do that for sure. We have a really wide temperature monitoring range from minus 55 Celsius to plus 125 Celsius. And so we can monitor, you know, cold um, northern regions, but we can also work, uh, monitor warmer things as well. The minimum sensor spacing is four inches um, or 10 centimeters, which in a lot of these mining applications we're going to be talking about isn't really what we're working on. We're talking about wider area monitoring. Um, and then we have a couple different types of cable, including our our gray armored cable, which is used for sort of protecting against animals chewing on the cable at surface and talking to people from different parts of the world. There's some sort of animal at every site that likes to chew on instrumentation cables. And I'm sure lots of you have experienced over time. We also have a few specialty sensors that are used to complement systems. So um, a common one is the air temperature sensor uh, with a radiation shield to protect um, the data from having influences from direct sunlight. And so that's an often common thing that's used to um, determine sort of the impacts from surface temperatures with what's happening within the ground. The other two uh, sensors are typically used more for um, protect perhaps industrial components of the site. Um, so we can put them inside tanks or thermal wells uh, or on a, a metal structure as well. Um, this D605 is our main data logger. And so we can read up to four temperature cables with that. And it's got embedded inside of it, a radio satellite modem that's used for data transmission from anywhere, any location in the world. The front face of it is also a solar cell, uh, so if it's pointed towards the equator, we're able to keep the battery charged in it. Um, and so we have these installed in, you know, the far northern part of the world, um, where the, you know they've got multiple months of the year without any sunlight, and so it's able to work through those darker months and then start charging again once the sunlight returns. Uh, this unit's fully sealed. Um, and watertight, and it's plug and play with connectors on the bottom, so the temperature cables simply plug in. You don't have to do any wiring at site. There's no programming to do or anything like that. And we have a capture app um, for iOS, and that's used to do you know, your setup at initial installation. You can also download the data from that um, locally at site if you'd like to, or take a spot reading um, at any time. Um, one other thing I wanted to note is that you'll see some of the photos as I move through this slide of a different logger that's either white or yellow. That's our previous generation of logger. Um, we've got the D405 and the D505 that I'll be referencing. And so this is the latest one that came out last year. So when the data comes up to the cloud, um, it comes into our beta cloud web application. And so all the data is housed in a database in the cloud. And then we have this front end uh, display, which users can use to log in and view their data. Um, so it's got a time series plot, uh, as can see at the top here, you can adjust the time frames that you're looking at and see all the temperature sensors from that profile, as well as as you have to log it, it will um, change the, the timestamp you're looking at, which will impact the point data at the bottom as well as the vertical. Um, we also have a map view of it, so you can see where they're installed at the site on Google or sort of image. And then you can either download data from CSV to, uh, you know, using another program, or we have an API to connect up as well. Uh, 
We also connect up the third party data loggers and a couple of the case studies in this um, slide deck show that. And so we use a few different types of interfaces to convert from our temperature table signal to either an SDI 12, um, an RS-485 Modbus signal, or we can either go on to an Ethernet local area network um, as well. So now we're going to move into the applications in cold region mining. And this first application, which is permafrost characterization, is the number one sort of application people often think of for using temperature monitoring and thermistor strings and things like that. And so for those of you who may not be from um, permafrost regions, just a quick definition of it is permafrost is ground soil or rock that remains at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius or lower for at least two consecutive years. And so the climate is warming, um, which means that the permafrost is also warming. And the Arctic's actually warming up four times faster than other parts of the world. And so it's becoming a big issue at a lot of sites. Um, a lot of northern infrastructure is being impacted by permafrost law. Um, when permafrost is ice rich, um, you know, it can have big ice lenses and stuff like that in there. As it thaws, the ice melts and it can create voids in the ground that can result in clumps, subsidence, differential settlement. And in the mining aspect, in particular, it'll impact the infrastructure at the site. So that includes dams, waste dumps, roads, buildings, things like that um, at the site. So the problem um, that you're trying to solve here is you need to understand the temperature profile of the permafrost over time so that you can make sure that you are designing and maintaining your structures at your site um, appropriately so that you'll be able to work for the life that they need to. Um, installation of these ground temperature tables are typically in vertical holes into the ground or if you have an inclined drill hole that you're using for exploration, um, they're also often installed in those as well. And the depth of the installation really depends on the permafrost thickness at that site. It can vary from, you know, a handful of meters up to hundreds of meters in, in thicker zones, and also the application that you're trying to monitor. If you're doing something very shallow, like maybe just the roadway, you don't really need to understand what's happening at 500 meters depth. Whereas if you're looking at the impacts that can happen on an underground mine, then yes, obviously you would need to go monitor quite a bit deeper. And so we've done the applications in, in both of those sort of extremes. The sensors are often concentrated closer to the sensor, to the surface of the ground, where there's an active layer in the permafrost that will see seasonally um, freeze and thaw. And then they tend to spread out below that um, to cover the rest of the, the length of the drill hole. The next application, which is specific to permafrost areas as well, is frozen tailing stems. And so some of these uh, tailing storage facilities uh, built on permafrost are designed to be frozen um, forever, and that's part of their containment. Um, so that can include the foundation of the dam or the core, both of them. And, you know, as I discussed in the previous couple slides, the climate's warming. And so understanding, uh, is it still in a frozen state? Is there any changes happening is an important component. And so monitoring that is really critical for the long-term um, conditions of these structures. So with this, you want to understand the temperature of the core or the foundation that is frozen. And so it involves a series of, of ground temperature cables being installed. And it would really be specific to the design of the dam um, that you're monitoring itself. But in a lot of cases, what we've seen is it's, there's upstream monitoring, downstream monitoring of the dam, um, horizontal and vertical installations. And they're typically installed while the dam's under construction initially so that um, you got data from the very beginning. And where there's two trenches used or liners, uh, there's also um, monitoring included in that as well. The next application is cold region heat leach. And so year-round operation of these um, heat leach pads requires that the acid leach solution doesn't freeze. 
And so this may not be specifically to a permafrost region, but even somewhere where it just gets cold enough in the winter that you can get freezing um, may also be of good concern. These pads are really long, er large areas. Um, you know, they can be in the acres kind of thing. And so understanding the subsurface or solution, subsurface or temperatures, the solution and the pond temperatures requires having a monitoring program on it. Um, but a question I kind of have is, you know, for looking at heap leach in any region, are there other processes within the pads um, and within the, um, the sort of the installation where it could benefit from temperature monitoring? So any sort of chemical or biological processes um, that are occurring that may be having a temperature signature. So for this specific application of cold region heat leaches, you need to avoid freezing of the solution, um, specifically in maybe in the pregnant solution pond. And so installation of horizontal ground temperature cables um, over a large spatial area of these pads with a large number of sensors helps you to understand uh, the, under, the temperature within the ground. Um, and so what we've seen is that they'll use a, a long cable with maybe dozens of sensors on it. And that really got, allows them to sort of understand it in different parts of the um, installation. Another one, which is um, sort of in a different realm, and, and again, it can be in really any cold region, and it's definitely not specific to permafrost, but is avalanche forecasting. And so mining operations that are in avalanche prone zones need to consider the impacts to you know, safety and protection of assets and things like that at those sites. So in some, times, uh, some cases, they're able to construct facilities where they are protected from avalanches. You know, they could use snow shed, sheds or tunnels, um, but in other cases, that's not practical. And so they'll need to be understanding the risks from avalanches and forecasting it uh, to keep everything safe at the site. So for this, you're going to need real-time data for forecasting, and part of that can be understanding the temperature of the snowpack. Um, so this would be, you know, complementary data to, you know, a weather station and other sorts of inputs towards a, a avalanche forecasting. Temperature on its own probably isn't enough, um, but this is being used at different sites to um, help get more information for it. Um, so here. In this photo, you can actually see a vertical temperature table. It, it's white, just along where I'm sort of showing my cursor right now. And so it's installed off of a post with a small arm and just sort of dangles towards the ground. And as the snow builds up around that, um, there's temperatures every 15 centimeters on it. And so you can start to understand the temperature of the snowpack as the snow builds around them. And you can see which sensors are still above the snowpack by seeing them sort of experience daily temperature variations between uh, day and nighttime. Um, in this location, you can see the size of the person. Uh, there's a lot of stuff at this site. Um, so with this, we're able to achieve the near surf, mid and full pack snow gradients and, and snow depth, and other as well as other parameters. And that's a good input for them to use in their forecasting models. Uh, winter and ice roads, um, again, are, you know, specific to northern sites. Um, and so for northern resource projects, it allows for ground transportation of goods and equipment, especially heavy equipment, which can't be done year round. Um, if you're traveling over areas without permanent roadways, if you're going over tundra, if the, you know, the winter road is over bodies of water, there's only a small window every year that you're able to move that equipment. Um, alternatively, flying in heavy equipment and supplies, um, it gets very costly very quickly. And so being able to mobilize all of this equipment, you know, during on a winter road um, helps sort of uh, lower the cost of that transportation. But again, as the climate warms, that open road is shrinking every year um, and making it putting more strain on the system and making every day that that road can be open more valuable. And so current monitoring methods, especially in Canada, somebody out in these remote locations um, they may be drilling a hole to see how thick um, you know the ice is at that point or pulling along a, a GPR sled um, but both involve sending somebody out there and so you know the problem needing real-time monitoring data 
where you can maximize the road opening and without having to send somebody out to the site to actually co collect that data. And so we've been doing monitoring of winter and ice roads for over 15 years on the north slope of Alaska for the oil and gas operations. And it's kind of the same principles you'd be using into a mining operation. They're bringing heavy equipment and supplies. It's the same type of thing. And so you install shallow temperature cables into the ground within the roadway and on the con a control cable on the outside of the road um, at periodic distances uh, along it. Um, so typically it requires five to eight kilometers, but if you have a specific crossing or something like that you're worried about, you might install it there as well. And so you'll receive a profile of um, a handful of sensors worth of data that shows how what the current temperature is so that you can kind of understand how thick um, is the frozen area, so whether or not you're on tundra or you're on water. And then that helps you avoid sending people out to start building the road or doing any testing until it's safe um, and you know that it'll be fine for them to go out there. And then this one is kind of a, a bit of a bucket at other operational conditions. Um, and so understanding the real-time temperatures of other fluid-based processes in cold regions may also be helpful. Um, and the photo here is of a uh, tailings dam with a French drain at the toe, um, and it's collecting sewage, and it needs to be able to work year-round. So there's a case study I'm going to talk about more about this later on. But there may be other um, applications similar to that where understanding when something freezes may impact some of the processes or operations of the mine. And so being able to put in mitigation efforts earlier on might be also really helpful. So just sort of a question out there, is there any processes that come to mind from any sites that you work at? So we're gonna move a little bit more into applications that are applicable for any mining region. And so these ones, are not necessarily cold region dependent. So artificial ground freezing is um, a methodology used to create frozen curtains within the ground uh, that can help prevent groundwater ingress into a zone or an excavation, um, or also be able to use the shore up the ground. So within the mining sort of scope, they'll be used for um, shaft sinking, um, for maintaining uh, groundwater, um, or from being able to flow out of maybe contaminated zone um, or shoring up rock um, that may be weaker or if you've got a lot of groundwater that may flow into an underground working as well. So a chilled brine solution is pumped into um, pipes installed in drill holes and that chilled brine is circulated through a system that helps to remove the heat from the ground. And so once that's frozen, the ground is significantly stronger and it's impermeable. Um, you're basically freezing the pore water within the ground. And monitoring that's really critical to understand when it's frozen um, before you start to do any excavation or have people go into that area. Um, or in the case of, you know, containing potentially contaminated groundwater, making sure that it's not being able to get out of the zone that you're working in. So the problem here again is, is temperature data needed to model that freeze curtain development before you start to excavate. So the data that collects from this system is actually used within modeling software to understand um, how it's being frozen within the ground. So here you'll have instrument in installation of temperature cables within the targeted frozen zone. Um, and the sensors are typically con uh, concentrated in critical depths, like perhaps where the underground opening is actually at. And for deep mining applications, this really calls for robust solutions. Um, you've got potential of really high water pressures uh, in contact with these uh, temperature cables and the need to monitor for many years at a time. So we actually protect these cables within a stainless steel conduit, which is what's shown in this picture here. Um, and I've got a, a case study around this application too to get into more depth on it. Uh, tailings dam seepage is the next application. And so seepage patterns and the, um, the rate of seepage directly within the bank dams isn't really commonly monitored. And often seepage is collected at the toe um, within sort of a trench and monitored there. Um, so some of that seepage may not be collected, but you also don't know exactly what's happening within the dam body itself. And the temperature might not be um, a really obvious sort of um, 
factor of, of monitoring seepage or flow rate, but actually the water that's moving through the dam carries a temperature signature with it. And so as the dam, um, sorry, as the water leaves the ponded area, it's going to have sort of that seasonal water temperature of um, the pond at that time of year. And it's going to continue to carry that through the dam. So as you start to see um, the, the, how long it sort of takes from the, the water to leave the pond to your sensors, you can see if that rate speeds up or slows down, or if that m water starts to move to different areas of the, the dam as well. And so using a network of temperature sensors within the embankment allows for observation of any changes here. And so something that's been kind of out there in the industry for a long time is distributed fiber optic cables, um, where you're actually monitoring kind of full profiles along long lengths of the dam. Um, but it's never really particularly taken off because of the cost of the interrogator that you use to actually collect the data and the data analysis needed to do afterwards. So this is one way that you can kind of um, also monitor it and get that temperature data as well, but connect it up into existing data logger networks you may already have. So the problem is understanding real-time seamless changes within the dam embankment. And so you'll have a series of horizontal or vertical cables um, with a tight space of sensors that kind of creates a grid of temperature points within your dam that you can then use to model um, flow. And so if you, you know, see um, data leaving the, the pond with a certain temperature signature and it takes, you know, X amount of time to reach a certain sensor, and then that rate starts to speed up and it's now you know, significantly faster, you know that there's something going on that you need to go explore further. Um, similarly, if you start seeing those flow patterns move to a different part of the dam, again, something's going on that needs more exploration as well. Um, and so the installation of these cables may depend on, you know, is the feelings dam already there? Um, it, as you're building a dam, horizontal cables are easy to install, but obviously once it's been built, it's, it's a lot more difficult. So using vertical holes or even installing into existing conduits you may not be using, such as an old standpipe or an old inclinometer are possible as well. Um, acid mine rock drainage is another application here. And so this one here, you know, acid generation within waste rock dumps, tailored storage facilities, um, and other types of um, mine assets are causing in environmental issues to the surrounding waterways and groundwater. And so the chemical process within the acid generation um, has a temperature signature. So understanding where you're getting temperature changes within the ground actually is an early indicator of acid generation. And so arrays of these temperature sensors can be used to provide a, a wide spatial data that's happening within the structures um, and then allow you to do other monitoring or other remediation um, within different areas of the, you know, where you're actually having issues. So with this, the, it's the problem is needing spatial data points um, or looking for potential acid generating hotspots. Uh, water quality monitors um, or air quality as well, those sensors can be quite expensive. And so by monitoring the temperature, you can get kind of a wide area of data and then strategically add in those other types of sensors um, to understand what's happening further when you see areas that have concerns as well. And then back background environmental conditions is another application as well. So um, mining operations can impact the you know, downstream environment. So that's groundwater and surface water, such as lakes, rivers, or streams. So understanding those background baseline conditions and then any future trend changes can help for um, early detection of any impacts. And so, you know, strong social and environmental licenses for mining operations should be accounting for what are the environmental impacts that are happening downstream. So the problem is understanding your background conditions so that you know what's happening at the site and you can make any changes that need to be done. So you can install temperature sensors within waterways such as lakes, rivers, or streams. Um, it's ideal to begin that before mining so you can establish what is the baseline for that site and understand what's happening. 
And then the time as mining starts again, you can monitor impacts to wildlife, the vegetation, or downstream communities below um, below the mine. So returning back to the temperature as an analog concept. Um, so temperature can be monitored within the ground or the water uh, to just start understanding what's happening. Is it steady state? Are the things changing? And then what could those processes be that are happening um, that are causing those changes so that you can start to explore them and understand what's happening uh, before the issues become larger. So as I've been presenting these different applications, has anyone had any thoughts come up that of other potential applications that fit within this realm? Um, maybe drop them in the chat if you have any other thoughts. Okay, so I'm seeing wetland mapping and restoration. And yeah, for, for sure, I think that that would definitely be um, part of that kind of environmental conditions and, and reclamation as well, for sure. Um, we do have somebody that's doing uh, some monitoring of how the ground thaws in the spring um, to understand how snow will go into the ground um, as part of their reclamation as well. So definitely. All right, so we'll move now into um, a few case histories. And so um, these cover a couple of different four here for different um, applications. So the first one is a frozen foundations tailings dam um, in Inuit, Canada. And so here, this is an area that's built on perma uh, continuous permafrost, uh, very thick permafrost as well. And the tailings dam was designed to rely on a frozen foundation. Um, the core of it's not designed to be frozen, um, but this is done to prevent seepage through the foundation. And it was frozen based on passive freezing um, that we we're just using the cold ambient air temperature. Uh, no artificial freezing methods were used on it. And temperature monitoring is critical to understand how this um, dam is going to behave especially into the future as the climate continues to warm. So cables were installed um, both vertically and horizontally in the foundation as construction was started and, and continued on. And so they had um, upstream and downstream installations as well as there was a key trench in this um, dam. And so they had installations along the key trench as well. So they could understand the temperatures through different parts of it and they installed a number of cross sections as well along the length of the dam. Um, this is a situation where I'm referring to a 505 logger. As I mentioned before, these are previous generations of data loggers. And so this looks slightly different, but perform in a very similar way. And so they were used to transmit the data from the ground temperature cables to the satellite, to the cloud, um, for various stakeholders to be able to view the data. And um, You've got here at this site, uh, you know, consultants that were part of the original design and continue to this day um, that are obviously not at site permanently. And for them to be able to log in and see the data is really important. Um, you've got staff that shift in, you know, two weeks on, two weeks off. And so they're able to see the data whenever wherever they are. And as well, people in the mining um, sort of headquarters, which isn't at site either, that are able to log in and see the data whenever they need it as well. And so, you know, some of the reasons they went with the heat stream system is that they were able to have that data at their fingertips wherever they were in the world. Um, and there's a lot of stakeholders interested in this data. Um, and this monitoring is continuing to this day and will continue far into the future as well. Um, by not having to go out to the remote site, uh, you know, as the say the consultants during the initial stages of this, um, but even now for the, the mining operation itself, we're going to have budget savings by not having people go out, um, but it's also going to be a safety um, risk minimization uh, by not having people go out in the middle of winter to collect the data at this site either, uh, where it can get very cold um, at site uh, in the winter months. They also have a large number of sensors on a number of these cables as well, um, which makes the digital technology really helpful as well. Um, in kind of the last six months or so, they've actually 
connected up uh, their data platform, which is a broader data platform with a bunch of different types of sensors connected to it um, via a API to our beta cloud. So they're actually streaming data into their system as well um, without having to have anybody do any downloading of data and uploading to other systems. So that's been really helpful for them. Um, the next one is a French drain, the toe of the tailings dam. Um, I touched slightly upon it earlier on, but this is in northern Saskatchewan in Canada. And so at this um, mine site, the tailings dam is built um, basically right beside an existing lake um, at the site. And so they were finding that there was seepage of the water from the tailing pond ending up in the lake. And so they needed to construct a French drain at the toe of the tailings dam to collect that seepage and discharge it back into the, the tailings facility rather than having it discharge into the lake, potentially causing environmental issues. And so they need that to be able to run year round so that they weren't um, discharging water into the lake even in the winter months. And so they actually heated the drain that's there so that it would work year round. Um, but they needed to monitor that to make sure it was actually working as, as planned. And so if that drain were to freeze, potentially in the winter time, um, the seepage would bypass it and cause those environmental issues. So they used two temperature cables in this installation um, that were basically monitoring, you know, one side of the drain and then the other side of it. And so they were between 100 and 125 meters long. Uh, with sensors every 10 meters long, so they could understand what was happening along the whole profile. And they had a single 505 data logger with both of the cables connected, as you can kind of see in this photo here, um, transmitting data to the cloud. And so their uh, operations team is able to monitor that in real time, whether or not they're on site or not. Again, this is a, a site with um, shift work in and out, and they um, are able to see that data wherever they are. Um, an interesting one uh, component of this project is they ordered the gear um, and then their sump location moved between the time of ordering and their time of installation. So the data logger actually needed to be moved um, 10 or 20 meters farther away. So we were able to quickly uh, add them, um, you know, an extension cable with connectors at each end. So it was still nice and plug and play for them, but they were able to put the data logger where they needed to in the new location. And so that was a, a really quick fix, simple solution for them. And you know, common for things to move around at mine sites. So um, being flexible with that system was really helpful for that uh, installation. Um, so in here, you can actually see the data set. This is a period of time from early November to mid January um, of one. It looks like twenty end of twenty twenty to early twenty twenty one. So you can see the temperature sensors um, uh, along the different profile. Each line is a different sensor. And so at the um, you know, sort of middle of January timeline, you're approaching kind of freezing. So the team's able to monitor that, see if anything happens. And then they actually have um, uh, little openings, uh, I think every 20 feet along the pipe where they can put steam in it to um, thaw it and allow it to continue operating again. And so their teams are able to just sort of take a look, see where there's an issue happening and go in and do that mitigation effort to keep the drain up and running year round. So the next case study is um, deep active ground freezing. Um, so this is a underground mine um, in northern Saskatchewan as well. And so this is an underground uranium mine. And so they're using artificial ground freezing to um, freeze the ore body at 450 meters depth. So they install large panels of drill holes um, in like six by six meter grids down to 450 meters depth so you can see each one of these um, sort of white housings is you know, another drill hole that they're using um, pumping chilled brine down to be able to freeze the ground and so at the site they're using ground freezing um, to minimize the risk of water inflow into the mine workings and as well as strengthen the weak rock there and they're using a brine solution which is 30 percent calcium chloride um, pump from surface down into those drill holes in kind of a continuous system to um, extract heat from the ground and freeze it. So temperature monitoring is critical for this uh, to be able to confirm the effectiveness of their ground freezing. 
it takes about one and a half to two years for them to curl one of these production panels, which is 100 to 120 hold. And then it takes another two to five years to freeze the ground. So this is, you know, a big operation, long-term monitoring, but also under really, really tough conditions um, for instrumentation. So the temperature cables go down to 450 meters depth. Um, and at the bottom of the hole, they can experience up to five and a half MPAs, water pressures, um, minus 40 temperatures, and 30% calcium chloride brine. So it's very challenging for this. And so we've worked with them to come up with a good solution um, that's been working now for um, over five years. So we install the temperature cables into a continuous piece of stainless steel conduit. And we actually use smaller diameter molds than our typical cables so that we can fit these into half inch conduit. And we build it to that full 450 meter length. And um, the next photo on the next slide will show how we are able to build them that long. Um, the benefits include, so when we ship them, we actually ship them out on a wooden stool so they can mount that on a frame and just rapidly install it off of it, um, off the spool and into the ground. So the stainless steel is gonna protect against those, you know, five and a half MPA water pressures, against the calcium chloride brine, um, but also just against any uh, mechanical damage to the cable as it's being installed into the ground as well. Uh, at this site, they're uh, connecting our temperature cables into a, a third party SCADA system or data logger at site. Um, so they're converting our, our signal into um, a Modbus RS-485 signal and connecting that in with other process instrumentation and collecting their data in that um, method. And so this photo here is um, a beautiful photo, but also shows how we actually install our temperature cables into 450 meters of steel. Uh, our team goes out to a, a racetrack um, in the Anchorage area and runs that cable out and the conduit out the full length um, along that racetrack and pulls it through and then coils it back up onto the spool as well. So, you know, they ended up going with us because we were able to manufacture these long custom cables to meet the really challenging site conditions there. And they've been using our cables, I think, since about 2015 um, on each subsequent freezing um, phase of the project. And um, that data is really used to confirm the ground temperature freezing before they start advancing active mining into that area. And then the final case study that I have to present is a heap leach facility um, in Alaska. And here it's an open pit gold mine um, and they're using cold climate, cold region um, heat leach uh, for extraction. And so this facility is um, 20 hectares or 50 acres of land and it's extending, standing, uh, pardon, extending the mine life by uh, 10 years, which is really helpful for them um, if you're operating. And so they're actually monitoring the ore body, um, the solution, as well as the pregnant solution pond to make sure it doesn't freeze during the winter time so that they can continue to process ore throughout the year. So at this site, they had two cables installed. Um, they're each almost 200 meters long with 61 sensors on them, um, and then a 15 meter armored lead to reach the data logger. And so in this situation, um, having 61 sensors on a cable really is only practical with a digital temperature cable versus an analog sensor, um, where you would need to have a whole bunch of temperature cables to be able to, to monitor that many sensors. Um, we also installed these uh, cables into our PEX conduit, which is what you can see in the photo here, um, which is used to help protecting against the crush. Um, these were horizontal installations, so they weren't necessarily going to experience, um, you know, high water pressures from a you know installation. Uh, but there, you know, is rock being moved around and um, fill being put on top of them and things like that. So the PEX conduit gives up some mechanical protection. And then each one of these temperature cables was connected to a D405, again with the satellite transmission to um, send the data up to the cloud. And so, you know, in this situation, why beaded stream was that the digital cables were really the main solution to be able to monitor that many temperature points over that far of a distance. And that data is really important for them to be able to keep this running year round at their site. And then they can make adjustments to their process uh, if they see that anything is starting to freeze uh, and that helps them just keep it up and running and be proactive about it. So 
So that's kind of the end of the presentation. I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we're going to be at the SME Mine Exchange um, in about a week and a half's time. We've got a booth number 2903. So if anyone's going to be there, um, come by and say hi. It'd be great to meet in person. Um, but at that time, if there's any questions sort of before we come up to the top of the hour, um, people can drop them into the chat and I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, yeah, I see your question there, Shane. Um, yes, so the spacing of the temperature sensors on the cable is completely custom. So we can have variable spacing along the same cable. The, um, you know, the limits are 125 max sensors, you know, 750 meters along the cable, and the minimum spacing of 10 centimeters. And so beyond that, um, there's a lot of cases where people will concentrate sensors in a certain zone that's most critical and maybe space them out into the other areas as well. I see the question from Rodrigo. The longest cable we've built, um, we've built a 750 meter cable uh, for a deep permafrost application um, using our, our signal protocol. And then we've actually done some that were slightly longer where we converted to the Modbus signal um, partway down the hole uh, to extend them. I think they might have been closer to a kilometer at that point. And of course, my contact information is on here as well. So if you have any other questions that come up afterwards, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right, well, thank you everybody.